Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We thank you for the series you are starting with us today on the book of the Psalms. We're praying that along with the choir members singing, you will open our eyes that we may see the things you are preserved for us in your word tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray that as we go through this series of the studies on the Psalms, that the devotion, the faith, the trust in God, and the benefits we ought to receive from these devotional studies, you will grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name, as you have promised us the Holy Spirit, that he will teach us all things. He will guide us into all truth. He will bring into our remembrance the things that you have preserved for us in your word. We are praying and claiming in faith the assistance and the help of the Holy Ghost so that your truth will be revealed to everyone coming to these studies in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray that every week as we come, you will enrich our lives. You will make us strong in the inner man so that we will be able to walk the way of faith like you have taught the Bible characters we too will be able to do the same thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray today as you learned last week we're starting a new series and the series is on the Psalms of David and the other writers that God used to pen or to write the Psalms. Obviously, as you will expect, we will not be able to study all the Psalms. That will take us three years, week by week. We may be able to group some of the Psalms together, but we'll do enough of the Psalms to be able to get all that the Lord has preserved for us in the book of the Psalms. Today being the introductory lesson or the introductory study to the book of the Psalms, I'll say some general things concerning the book of the Psalms itself. So you will be able to launch into the deep and get a feel of what the Lord has preserved for us in this part of the world. The major part of the Psalms has for their subject the praises of the Lord. That means in many parts of the Psalms, you will see that the psalmist instructs and leads the readers to praising the Lord. And therefore it was called by the Jews the Book of Praises. And actually, originally, the Psalms were intended to be sung in the Jewish service. But it is not only limited to singing. We are to admonish one another. We are to teach one another in the Psalms. Which is the reason for our coming together to study the Psalms. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In that verse of scripture, you will see very clearly, it says that an area where we can admonish ourselves, encourage ourselves, lift up ourselves, and teach one another, is the area of the Psalms. This is the reason why we're studying the Psalms at this time because there is a lot of teaching a lot of admonition a lot of instruction exhortation and encouragement in the book of the Psalms in Luke chapter 24 Jesus Christ taught his own disciples not only that he taught his disciples out of the Psalms he regarded the Psalms as part of scripture from which we can get doctrine, from which we can get instruction and correction and rebuke. 
in Luke chapter 24, from verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Here Jesus Christ explained to his own disciples things that were written concerning him. And he picked those things out of the law of Moses, out of the writing of the prophets, and out of the Psalms. That tells you something, that as the Pentateuch, that means Genesis to Deuteronomy, were inspired of the Lord. And as the writings of the prophets were inspired of the Lord, in the same way, to the same level, for the same purpose, the Psalms were inspired of the Lord. Not only that, if you look at verse 45, it says, He opened their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Two things stand out very clearly there. One, the law of Moses was regarded by Jesus as scripture. Two, the prophets were regarded by Jesus as the scriptures. And three, the Psalms were regarded by the Lord Jesus Christ as scripture. Not only that, you open their understanding. You have seen as we have studied parts of Exodus and parts of Leviticus in our Sunday scriptures on Sunday that we need our eyes to be opened. We need instruction and teaching. We need a lot of application or explanation before we can understand the law of Moses. Not only that, as we have read together, we have studied Daniel sometimes. You will see that it takes a lot of teaching, a lot of instruction, exposition, before we can understand the writings of the prophets. But understand that it takes the same teaching, instruction, and exposition before we can understand the book of the Psalms. That's the reason at this time we're studying the Psalms. Because we need our eyes to be opened so that we can understand the things that are written in the Psalms. Not only that, you will see. In fact, as we study Psalm 2 next week, you will see that many of the Psalms are written concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot fully know Christ except you study the Psalms and you see the things that were written concerning him. When you think about it, that the disciples had doubt concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And concerning the ministry of Jesus Christ. Concerning the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in order to convince them about his ministry. And about what the Lord had given him to do. And about his resurrection. He had to go into the Psalms. Telling and teaching of the things that were written aforetime concerning him. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. From verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. The early church, very few people, 120 believers, disciples. They needed a major decision in the church. And it was the decision to replace the ministry of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot had fallen away. He had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ and eventually had committed suicide. And they wanted to make up the number of the apostles so that from 11 they will become 12. And there was a place in the Psalms that they needed to refer to, to settle all disputation. To settle the minds of the early church, that it had been written and prophesied in the Psalms, that there would be a person like Judas Iscariot, and that after he had led the bishopric, or the ministry, that let another person take that office. If the believers of that time could refer back to the Psalms, is settling one of their greatest problems at that time. How much more today that the believers and the church as a whole should have 
a better understanding of the psalm so that when confusion or controversy when difficulties arise in your personal life or in your family life or in the church will be able to refer to the psalms concerning the things that are reaching a poor time to settle all those things that's the reason at this time that we're getting into the study of the psalms there are a lot of questions in your mind that the psalms will answer acts chapter 13 from verse 32 acts 13 verse 32 and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers god has fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up jesus again as it is also written in the second psalm thou art my son this day have i begotten thee you can see from the verses i've read that the apostles here were preaching an evangelistic message i've shown you the importance of the psalms to the believers jesus christ in order to settle his own disciples he referred to the psalms so that they will see all the things that had been done to him his betrayal his crucifixion his death and his resurrection they are according to what had been written in the law of moses in the prophets and in the psalms and he settled and established the church the believers in referring to the psalms not only that as they needed to replace judas iscariot a matter they needed to settle within the church they had to refer to the book of the psalms now we come to the people of the world there are people that have not been born again and they need the evangelistic message and there is a lot for the unbeliever a lot for the sinner as we will see in our study of the psalms here we are told that jesus christ was raised from the dead and now we refer to the book of the psalms it says as also it is written in the second psalm thou art my son this day have i begotten thee and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead now no more to return to corruption he said on this wise i will give you the sure mercies of david wherefore he says also in another psalm thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption if you have read the new testament very well you will see that the resurrection of the lord jesus christ is an important part of the gospel message because no one can be saved no one can be born again except he believes in his heart and he confesses with his mouth that god raised him from the dead and here again the psalm is referred to verse 35 wherefore he says also in another psalm thou shalt not suffer thine only one to see corruption for david after he had served his own generation by the will of god fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption but he whom god raised again saw no corruption i believe you see the importance of the psalms and this is the reason why we're studying the psalms we as a church we need the writings of the psalms and the unbelievers too they need the psalms and so whether you are a saint or a sinner as we come all through these mondays in our new series on the psalms you will find a lot that is meant for your comfort for your encouragement a lot that is meant to uplift you in your christian life the psalms inspired by god as all scriptures are were penned by various authors the penman that is the writer the author of most of them was david the son of jesse these psalms instruct and lead us to trust in god to praise the lord and to pray unto him they show us ways in which we keep communion with him in all the various conditions and circumstances of the human life today we're starting with psalm 1 an appropriate introduction to the book of the psalms psalm 1 let's look at it i read to you from verse 1 blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the lord 
and in his law does he meditate day and night. And it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The, God, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Psalms open with this first psalm, and it talks of blessedness. Now, the key to the Psalms is hung at the door. At the very threshold of the book of the Psalms, we have the way to blessedness. Which means then, if you will study your eyes, the Psalms will show you the way of happiness. The way for solid spiritual pleasure. The way of having joy unspeakable or the fullness of joy. Because at the very beginning, we are told how we can be blessed by the Lord. Just like Jesus opened up his ministry in the Beatitudes. And he tells us the way of the blessed. Same blessed are the poor in spirit. In the same way, David, the psalmist, opens up in the Psalms. And he says, this is the way of blessedness. He says, blessed is the man. Which man? An Israelite? Not necessarily. Which man? A Gentile? Not necessarily. Which man? Whosoever. Because you see, it tells us, it doesn't tell us the way of blessedness or the man that is blessed by name. It tells us the man that is blessed by description. And it says, it is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. It is the man that standeth not in the way of sinners. It is the man that sitteth not in the seat of discomfort. There's a difficulty here. The difficulty is this. The psalmist recognizes the fact that we are born in sin. We are conceived in sin. The psalmist recognizes the fact that it's not righteous. No, not one. The psalmist recognizes the fact that everyone walks in the wicked way. How then can we come into the way of, the, of blessedness? How then we will not walk in the way of discomfort? How shall we not stand in the way of sinners? How shall we not sit in the seat of discomfort? Look at Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here we learn from the psalmist that there is none righteous, no, not one, that we were conceived in sin, we were born in sin, and therefore the natural thing for everyone to do is to walk the way of sin, is to go with sinners and to sit in the seat of this comfort. How then will a man born in sin, conceived in sin, raised up in sin? How then will a man that has gone astray from the point, from the point that he was even born into this world, how then will that man come into the blessedness of the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, that standeth not in the seat, in the stand in the way of sinners, nor seateth in the seat of discomfort? There's only one way. By repentance, praying to the Lord, and asking forgiveness from the Lord. That's what we call being born again. In Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now you can understand this psalm. It's not telling us that man can live a righteous life on his own. Psalm 1 is not telling us that in your own strength, in your own power, you can refuse to stand in the way of sinners, or you can refuse to walk in the way of the ungodly, or you can refuse to sit in the seat of discomfort. 
In your own strength, you are a sinner. In your own power, you remain a sinner. Because you are born in sin. In sin did your mother conceive you. But then it says, when your sins are forgiven, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When you come to the Lord in repentance, and you say, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I have missed my way. I know that I was conceived in sin. I know that I was born in sin. I know that even as soon as I was born, I went astray. But I want the blessedness of the righteous. It is only then that you will be forgiven. And then all your iniquity will not be imputed unto you anymore. He will cleanse you. He will take away all your sins. Then you become redeemed. And as the redeemed of the Lord, you get into the blessedness of the Lord. In Psalm 40, verse 4. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. How do we become believers in the Lord? One, we repent of our sins. That's what we read about in Psalm 32. Two, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by the way of faith. Now, you may think that the Old Testament people only depended upon the blood of the animal, without trusting in the Lord, without believing in the Lord. Of course, they believed in the Lord. Look at Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears as thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering as thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, my, thy law is within my heart. This is looking forward to the time when the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, will come. The Old Testament people knew that ultimately it is not just the blood of bulls and goats. It is not just the Old Sacrifices or Old Testament Sacrifices. It is in the trust in the faith that they had in God. The God that ordained those sins. What the psalmist was saying here is that the sacrifices themselves, without believing in the Lord that ordained it, will not give them forgiveness. They were trusting in the Lord. That's why you have read in verse 4, Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. This is how they came into the blessedness of Psalm 1 and of the Psalms that will be studying. In Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy cause, which shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. The psalmist recognizes that the sinner is separated from the Lord. The sinner is rejected by the Lord. But when you confess your sins, asking for forgiveness, according to Psalm 32, you are forgiven. All your iniquities are taken away from you. Your iniquities are not imputed unto you anymore. And according to Psalm 40, where we have read, you trust in the Lord. And as you trust in the Lord, then He chooses you. He chooses you for His own. He redeems you. And that's why it says, you are a chosen generation. You have not chosen him, but I have chosen you. And then he causes you to approach unto him. The middle wall of partition is broken down. All the things that separated you from the Lord, they are totally taken away. That he may dwell in thy courts. You become a member of the family of God. And thereafter, you will be satisfied with the goodness of his house. Let's go back to Psalm 1. Verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. This man we are talking about, this is the man that had been redeemed, redeemed of the Lord. But there is one thing that characterizes, characterizes the life of the redeemed. It is purity. That's why we have titled the first part of the study, the purity of the redeemed. And if you are a child of God, this is what will characterize your life. 
One, you do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Two, you do not stand in the way of sinners. Three, you do not sit in the seat of the scornful. There's a lot to say about that verse, but look at this. That if you are a child of God, your life is characterized by purity. What is purity? Purity is that thing that makes you totally different from the sinner, from the ungodly, from the scornful. When a man is totally different from the sinner, that man is pure. Different in the heart, different in his motives, different in his lifestyle. When a person will not walk, will not stand, will not sit with the sinners, the ungodly, and the scornful. When a person will not go, the way of the unbeliever that's the redeemed of the lord that man is pure before the lord look at proverbs chapter 1 from verse 10 my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not you can see the difference here between the son and the sinner the sinners are not children of god but my son if you become a child of god if you have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Which means, if you are a real child of God, you will be pure. You will be different from the sinner. Look at verse 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. You will be different. Like we learned yesterday at the Sunday worship. You will not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. If you have been redeemed, if you have become a child of God, your life will be totally different from the people of the world. You will not walk as other Gentiles walk. You will not go the way of the unbeliever. Verse 22, that she put up concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws. And in verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. But rather, let him labor working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needed. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And so, if we are children of God, then that means we have had assurance that our sins have been forgiven. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now our lives are totally different from the lives of the people of the world. The redeemed of the Lord will be pure and holy. Come back to Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor seated in the seat of the sinners, nor nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. I want to show you here that the Lord has placed before us two ways. He says, I place before you the way of life and the way of death. I place before you blessing or cursing or curse. Choose life that you may live. If you choose the way of the Lord, if you walk in the path of righteousness, the blessing of the Lord will be upon you. What will characterize your life? One, you will live a pure life. Two, you will delight in the law of the Lord. Verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. The righteous is characterized by meditation in the word of the Lord. The temptation is to meditate on your circumstances. To meditate, on, to meditate on the injury that people have caused you. To meditate on the poverty that you may be going through. To meditate on your circumstances or to meditate on misunderstandings and misrepresentations on the problems of life. 
you know when you meditate on those things your mind your heart will shift away from the platform or from the place of righteousness where you are if you meditate on your persecution on your problems on the things you are going through you'll become despondent you'll get into despair but the righteous will not meditate on the circumstances of life he will meditate on the word of god in the day and in the night in the day when the sun is shining in the day when there is a bright light in the day when all things appear to be prosperous he meditates upon the word of god in prosperity he meditates upon the commandments of the lord the commandments of the lord that will shield him from pride from temptation from the ways of the world but in the night when there is no light in the night of sorrow in the night of affliction he will not meditate on what the world is doing against him he will not meditate upon his circumstance he meditates upon the promises of god in the day meditate upon the commandments so that your joy your happiness will not make you to forget yourself and go astray in the night when things are hard when the sun is not shining when it is dark and cloudy and gloomy meditate upon the promises of the lord delight all the time in the word of the lord this is how you can remain in the blessing of the lord but you see many times some people in their problem even though they have been born again before they have been children of god they begin to get near the unbelievers and you know how they start they start walking in the way in the counsel of the ungodly you see a man who has been fervent before a man who has been blessed of the lord before a man who had been redeemed before but you see him now is backsliding little by little he is walking in the counsel of the ungodly instead of seeking counsel from the word of god instead of seeking counsel from children of god instead of seeking counsel from leaders that god has appointed in the church he will be seeking counsel from the ungodly and the ungodly will begin to sympathize with him the ungodly will begin to tell him look at your condition why are you still a christian why are you still going to that church and in walking in the counsel of the ungodly he begins to practice what they are telling him before long he will be standing in the way of sinners you see when a person is backsliding you progress in backsliding you start by just asking for advice from sinners you start by just getting near and saying to sinners what do you think about this you start by telling your boss who is an unbeliever well my boss i know that this is not an area of our work together but i'm thinking about marriage i'm thinking about a new job i'm thinking about my life i'm thinking about this well i know that you are older than i am you are my boss even though i'm a church man even though i'm a church lady and maybe you don't go to church but from your own experience and wisdom in life my boss i depend on you what do you think about this that's the beginning of backsliding or maybe you you go to your mother you go to your father and your mother or your father may not be a christian not born again yet you have the word of god david is old enough to be your father moses is old enough to be your father abraham is old enough to be your father all these people patriarchs and prophets and people in the bible they're old enough to be your daddy and your mommy why not go to them why not go to the scriptures and say well i will ask when david was in trouble how did he manage in that trouble when moses was in controversy and confusion how did he manage himself through those people are old enough to counsel us and the word of god is enough how about jesus christ the ancient of days we have just studied all those parables and all the statements i about paul the apostle paul the aged is he not old enough to counsel you but you see many times we leave all these uh, bible books and characters and we go to the unbelievers will say what do you think i should do it is the beginning of backsliding and then you begin to walk in the counsel of the ungodly then you make progress in your backsliding you stand in the way of sinners you are walking along with them before you stand in the way with them you spend more time you stand with them you are now becoming even rigid in your opinion with these people you are now making real solid friendship with them that you are standing in the way of sinners before long 
you will progress from, from just walking and standing. You will be sitting in their seat. You will know their jokes. You will know all the pranks they play. All the things they say to tease and to tempt and to torture the believers. You will know all about them. Before long, you will be casting the same joke. Before long, you will be sitting in the seat of this comfort. Before long, you will be saying, uh, that's how they have been saying, Jesus will come, Jesus will come. You will be sitting in the seat of this comfort. Before long, you will be saying, that's how they were saying, don't marry a non-believer, don't marry a non-believer. You will be sitting in the seat of this comfort. And you know, the way of the backslider is very, very slippery. The moment you begin to walk in the way, in the counsel of the ungodly, if you are not careful before long, you will be standing in the way of sinners. If you are not careful before long, you will be sitting in the seat of discomfort. But let's remain the redeemed of the Lord. Because if we remain the redeemed of the Lord, blessings will come upon our lives. And as we read in the book of the Psalms, you will see the blessedness, the blessedness that the Lord has preserved for the people of God. Let's look now at the provision for the righteous. From verse 1 again. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, in, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of his comfort. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leave also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Here we have the provision of the Lord. You see, when you plant a garden, when you plant a seed, you water it. You take care of it. You protect it until it will bring forth fruit. The righteous is planted by the Lord. By the rivers of many waters. And the Bible says it will be fruitful and it will flourish like a tree. Psalm 92. From verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. It shall grow like a cedar in, Babel, in um, Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. In the courts of our God, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. You know, sometimes it's unfortunate that many people who do not understand the way of the Lord, they counsel young people, they advise young people. Sometimes an unbeliever will call a young lady or a young man, or maybe a teenager, and he will say, well, you are too young to be going to church every time. You are too young to concentrate on religion now. You see all those people that are preaching to you. Or oh, don't you know about that uh, your pastor? Or oh, he finished his education. He was even lecturing at the university. And then, now he has time for religion. You finish your education and then you will have time for religion. Don't you see all, the, all those people that are now carrying Bible and they are preaching? So look at so and so, look at so and so. They became old before they started all this religion. You are too young. As a teenager, concentrate on your studies. Concentrate on this or concentrate on that. When you have finished all that, then in life, you will, if you want to go to church, that will be all right. Or before you get married, people might call you, your mother might call you and say, this religion is too much. But I'm not saying you should not be religious, but at least get married first and have children and build a house. And when you are settled, then you can face religion. And it, also, it is also unfortunate for fathers and mothers who come to church and a church like this. If they see their teenage boy or teenage girl, the teenage boy wants to be in the choir, the teenage girl wants to be in the choir, and all these young people, they want to read Bible, they want to evangelize, they want to take part in house fellowship, they want to take part in all these uh, programs in the church. Even though these parents themselves, they are members of the church, 
even though these parents themselves, they say they are born again, they will call their children, they will say, come. You see, I'm a Christian. And you know I'm even a worker in our deeper life church. But you are too young. Now that I'm a Christian, look at the house I've built for you to live in. Look at the car I'm using. Look at the place I'm working. As my child, let me advise you. Go to church on Sunday. And then anytime you have bad dream and anytime you have uh, any sickness, you can go on Thursday. Monday, you can, I will bring outline for you. You can read that on Sunday at your spare time. But you are too young to be too religious and righteous now. I'm your father. I'm a Christian. I'm not telling you to backslide. Remain a Christian, but don't do too much of it. When you are as old as I am, then you can work for God. Those people do not realize that when we delight in the law of God, that we'll be blessed by the Lord. They are teaching their children that if you follow the Lord, the Lord will not bless you. They are teaching their children that if they follow the Lord, they will not prosper in life. But it says, if we follow the Lord, you will be like a tree planted. It says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. It shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the court of our God. Which means that if from your own young age you give yourself to the Lord, of course you will be fruitful. Of course the Lord will bless you. He will bless you with all spiritual and material and physical blessings. On the other hand, we have uh, some other people who when they were younger in the Lord and younger in age, they gave a lot of their time to the Lord serving the Lord. But now they say, well, I've given that work of the Lord for the rest of the people. I am getting old now. They say they are now above 50 or maybe above 60 or maybe they are now above 70. And they say now they cannot work for God anymore. That's why we do not have many old people in our choir. We have a few old people there. But we do not have many old people there. Because many of the old people, they say, ah, uh, they think that uh, the choir is meant for young, young people. Uh, as I travel about, I come across, uh, you know, some situations like that. In uh, one deeper life church in one of the states where I traveled, all those I saw in their choir, they must be from primary school to secondary school, le uh, secondary two level. I think all of them must have been about the age of 14 and 13 or 12. All the other people above 20, above 30, I didn't find any of them in the choir. And I spoke to some of the leaders there. I said, what's the matter with you? Old people here, you don't sing for the Lord. Jesus sang. The apostles sang. And the disciples and believers in the New Testament, they sang. How about you people? They make the church like uh, all these, um, you know, ancient Orthodox churches where only primary school children are in the choir. It is because they have a wrong impression that old people do not serve the Lord. But look at verse 14. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. If you are getting old, where is your fruit? If you are getting old, where is your service for the Lord? If you are getting old, where is your ministry for the Lord? And young people, you are planted already in the court of the Lord. Keep on bearing fruit. And as we grow old, let us keep on bearing fruit. Let's see the blessedness of the believer now in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Whatever spiritual blessings you have seen, in the New Testament, that other people received, you can receive. Did people in the Bible days get saved? You too can get saved. Were people in Bible days sanctified and made holy? You too can be sanctified and made holy. Have you seen the blessing of the Lord, spiritual blessing upon Enoch? That he walked with God 300 years without going astray, without backsliding? You too can have such a blessing. Have you seen Daniel? That he had a spiritual blessing. That even in Babylon, he will not deny the Lord. You too can have such a spiritual blessing. 
Have you seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That they took their stand and they had such a steadfast faith in the Almighty God. You too can have such a blessing. Have you seen the New Testament believers being baptized in the Holy Ghost? You too can have a blessing. Have you seen them having the blessing of answered prayer? You too can have all the spiritual blessings in Christ. In Second Peter chapter 2, chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life. Think about that. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Well, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost, baptism, steadfastness and faith to resist temptation and the devil, all that pertains to godliness. But he has also given us all things pertaining unto life. Pertaining unto life. You need healing? That's part of the all things pertaining to life. You need deliverance? That's part of all things pertaining to life. You need provision? That's part of all things pertaining to life. And he has provided for us all those blessings. Who are the heirs of those blessings? According to Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3, these blessings we have read about, whether they are spiritual or they are physical or material, they are for the people that delight in the law of the Lord, who meditate in the word of God day and night. These are the people that will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in the season. And the leaf shall not wither. And it says, Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When you look at a child of God, it doesn't matter where you put him. Doesn't matter where you put him. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Have you thought about the life of uh, Joseph? It doesn't matter where you put that man. Put him in Potiphar's house, he prospers. Put him in uh, the prison, he prospers. Bring him back out of the prison and get him to uh, Pharaoh's presence, he prospers. Get him in the time of prosperity, seven years prosperity, he prospers. And put him in the midst of a famine, seven years of scarcity, he prospers. Put him in the midst of friends of foes, he prospers. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Have you thought about Daniel? In the matters concerning the kingdom, at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, he prospered. When he ruled at the time of Belshazzar, he prospered. In the time of Darius, he prospered as well. And it doesn't matter where you place a righteous man. The righteous man will prosper in whatsoever he does. You see, sometimes you have believers and they say, Well, I don't know why I'm not prospering in this area. And they change the job, they go to another thing. After six months again, well, maybe this is not my way. They change job, they go to another thing. After one year, I don't know why I'm not prospering. They change jobs again. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Look at the church work. If a man is actually a real child of God and is meditating day and night in the word of the Lord, put him among the ushers, he will do it excellently well. And remove him there and put him in the choir, he will do excellently well. And remove him from there and make him to officiate in the house fellowship. He will do excellently well. Remove him from the house fellowship and bring him to the central church and let him do something. He will do excellently well. And call him out of that and tell him that I want you to supervise the building or you know the physical area of the work. Put him there. He will do excellently well. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost in him will do well anywhere. You know, if you, if you really have the Holy Ghost within you, if they place you there as an usher, you will do well. If the Holy Ghost is there within you, if they place you as a member of the choir, you will do well. Because it is not you. It is the Holy Ghost within you. You know, sometimes you give assignment to some people and you tell them, brother or sister, go and do this. Well, he said, I cannot do that. But Paul the Apostle said, I can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. If you are a child of God and you are part of the redeemed, part of the blessedness of the redeemed is that 
whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Let's look now at the rebels or the rebellious. From verse 4. The ungodly are not so. What does that mean? It says the believers will be approached. The ungodly are not so. It says the believers will do well anywhere you place them. The ungodly are not so. It says whatever the season, whatever the time, the godly people, the blessed people, the righteous redeemed, they will be bearing fruit in every season. The ungodly are not so. Think about every good thing in the life of the believer. Put a minus, a negative in front of it. That is what the unbeliever will have. If the believer is happy, put a minus before that. That sadness, the unbeliever will have it. If the believer is prospered, put a minus, a negative sign before that. There is poverty, the unbeliever will have that. If the believer has joy, put a negative sign before that. Then you have sorrow, the unbeliever will have that. If the believer is expecting having a hope of eternal life, living with God in heaven, put a negative thing before that, the unbeliever must be expecting to live in the fire of hell forever. Any good thing that happens to the believer, put a negative thing on that as for the unbeliever. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the wind driveth away. Which the wind driveth away. The wind of judgment. The wind of adversity. The wind of the wrath of God will drive the ungodly away as the wind drives the chaff away. And you see, when the wind drives chaff away, it drives it to only one place. That's the place of burning. And if you are the ungodly, the wind is blowing you already. The wind is driving you already. And if you do not stop and repent, there is nothing that will stop the force of that wind. You might go on until it blows you into the fire of hell. It says, therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. What it means is that on the day of judgment, there will be no excuse at all. You will not be able to defend yourself. All the books of the Bible will be against you. All the angels of God will be against you. All the redeemed of the Lord will be against you. All the examples and illustrations and the mercies of God from the eternal past to the eternal future will be against you. All the force and all the authority of the Almighty God will be against you. Think about yourself, a human being. You stand in, pres in the presence of God and all the angels of God witness against you. Gabriel, Michael, all the other angels, they witness against you. They say you must be condemned. How can you stand in judgment? And the Almighty Father, God Almighty, the Ancient of Days, He witnesses against you with all the knowledge He has against you. That's why the ungodly will not stand in the day of judgment. Not only that, your, your neighbors who believed in the Lord, those of us who have seen your life, those of us, don't you know, we shall judge angels and we shall judge the unbelievers, even the company of the redeemed of the Lord in their millions and billions. They will stand against you in the court of law here in the nation. When five people are standing against you, can you stand? When ten people are witnessing against you that they saw you, they caught you with cocaine. They caught you with that crime. They caught you with that thing that is evil. Can you stand? Think about when you come in the presence of God. And God is against you. And Jesus is witnessing against you. And the Holy Ghost that had been drawing you and pulling you and pleading with you. And you rejected and he witnesses against you. And then they bring all the angels of God to come and witness. And they witness against you. And then they bring all the redeemed of the Lord. Your believing husband, your believing wife, your believing children, your believing neighbors. They all witness against you. And above all, the devil that you served. And the fallen angels that you served. They all came also and they said, He is our member, he is part of us. He should go to hell with us. And they all witness against you. The ungodly shall not stand in judgment. Like Belshazzar, your knees will knock together. The sin will cover your mouth. Shame will cover you like a blanket. And then it says, Sinner shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. But the Lord is calling you today. If you will call upon the Lord today, today is still the day of mercy. And you can say, I do not want to face that. 
when God will be against me, Christ will be against me, Holy Ghost will be against me, angels will be against me, the congregation of the righteous will be against me. I want to make my way right with the Lord today. If you will call upon the Lord today, He will save you. He will take away all your sins. If you are a backslider, if you are a backslider, that day is coming. When all of heaven and hell will witness against you. When all the angels of God will witness against you. And they will tell you, you belong to a church like this, where the word of God is preached without fear, without favor. You belong to a church like this, where the way of redemption, the way of salvation has been made plain. And you tasted the word of salvation, the blessing of salvation before. But you went back to serve the devil. All heaven and hell and earth will witness against you. How will you be able to stand on that day? But the Lord is calling you. And he's saying today you can repent. Now believers, you are a child of God. Keep on standing. Keep on believing the Lord. Because the day is coming when eternal blessedness will be upon you. In Revelation chapter 21. And verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the first of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Believers, keep on looking up to the Lord. There may be a little temptation now, a little trial now. There may be a little difficulty now. There may be a little problem now. Don't look at that, because blessedness is coming eventually the lord will bless you on earth he will bless you in heaven he will bless you in time he will bless you in eternity and all the people of the ages that will be in heaven they will know that you are among the blessed the blessed people of the lord backsliders what are you waiting for call upon the lord do not wait for the time when heaven hell and earth will be against you sinners what are you waiting for do not wait for the time when all hell and heaven and earth will be against you. Let's rise up. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Come into the blessedness of the Lord. The Lord is calling you. The Lord is expecting you. Are you the man that is not walking in the way of sinners? Are you the man that is not standing in the way of sinners? Are you the man that is not sitting in the seat of discomfort? Are you delighting yourself in the word of the Lord? Are you meditating on the word of God day and night? Are you being fruitful? Are you being blessed by the Lord? Are you known by the Lord as a righteous, redeemed individual? Or are you a rebel? Are you a sinner? Are you a backslider? Are you waiting for the time when you will not be able to stand in judgment? The Lord is calling you. The Lord is calling you. Come to the Lord. 